Good morning, everybody, and welcome to our church service this morning. It's so nice to see all your lovely, lovely, smiling faces on this very chilly, cold morning. So thank you for waking up and getting out of bed and making your way to the very cold church building this morning. Welcome to all our visitors. We have a saying that as soon as you walk through those doors, we regard you as being part of the family. So welcome to the family. We hope that you enjoy the service with us today. And there's actually someone very special that's a visitor today, my maths teacher. So if you want to hear the skinner about me at school, then you need to go and chat to my maths teacher during coffee. I'm just saying. All right. Ndia nibulisa nonke gegama lenkosi yetu u Jesu Christu. I greet you all in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. I greet you all in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. All right, let's sing praise the Lord the Almighty. worship this morning comes from Lamentations 3 verse 22 to 23 and here we read the following because of the Lord's great love we are not consumed for his compassions never fail they are new every morning great is your faithfulness when we hear about the book Lamentations we immediately think complaints but in our call to worship this morning, Jeremiah lists some of the reasons he will always have hope, despite everything going wrong. His hope is there because of God's love, because of God's compassion, and because of God's faithfulness that is new every single morning. So no matter what happened before church today, or this past week, or this past month, God's love for us remains great. 
His compassion never fails and his faithfulness is new every morning. And this is the God who we worship. So let's come before our God of love and faithfulness. Let's share with him what's going on in our hearts and our minds as we prepare ourselves to meet him here today in silent and individual prayer. Let's pray. Our Lord of love, compassion and faithfulness, we humbly approach your throne this morning to come and seek you. You are our Saviour. You are our King. You are the Alpha and Omega. Before we think, you know our thoughts. Before we say anything, you know our words. Before we do anything, you know our actions. You know us upside down and inside out, and still you love us. Your holiness surrounds us daily. When we fall, you pick us up. When we are hopeless, you grant us hope. When we are overwhelmed, you give us peace. When we are lost, you find us. When we are worried and stressed, you guide us. When we are ill, you heal us. When we are hurt, upset and mourning, you console us. You mean so much to us, Lord, for you are our light, our refuge, our anchor and our foundation. To you we give all the honour and praise, King of Kings, Lord of Lords, our faithful, compassionate and loving parent. As we remind ourselves of all the things that you do for us, We know that we often fall short. And so, Lord, we approach you. Holy Spirit, come and show us where we went wrong in this past week. Where we put other things before you. Where our actions did not show your love, your compassion. Where our works did not reveal your splendor and grace. Convict us as we silently and individually approach you to come and confess our sins. Hear our words of confession, see our repentant hearts, transform us, renew us, change us to be ever more like Christ, so that when people see us, they experience something of our Lord. Lord, we come to ask, let your waters of grace, of mercy, and of compassion flow over us, cleansing us pardoning us of all our wrong choices, all our wrongdoings, and all our wrong actions. We know that you are the God of love, the God of grace, the God of second and third chances. We know that when we turn away from our own wickedness, and we earnestly turn to you, you forgive, and you separate our sin far away from us, never to think of it again. Do this for us now. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for your pardon. Thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you that you continue to love the sinner and not the sin. We praise you in your wonderful name. We praise your steadfast love. We praise your faithfulness to us that's new every morning. Come to meet us here now. Come and reveal yourself to each one of us. Open our hearts and our minds to your presence as you come to meet us in this holy space. Amen. Let us honour God by standing and singing together of his faithfulness 
as we sing the steadfast love of the Lord. Let's stand and sing together. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning, new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness, O Lord. Great The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases, His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning, new every morning, great is thy Our reading this morning comes from Jonah 3, verse 1 to 4, and also chapter 4, verse 1 to 11. And Zola is going to be reading that for us this morning. Good morning, Chesh. We read from the book of Jonah, chapter 3, verses 1 to 4, and then we skip to chapter 4, where we read verses 1 to 11. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Go to the great city of Nineveh and proclaim to it the message I give you. Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord and went to Nineveh. Now, Nineveh was a very important a visit it required three days. On the first day, Jonah started into the city. He proclaimed, 40 more days and Nineveh will be overturned. Jonah was greatly displeased and became angry. He prayed to the Lord, O oh Lord, is this not what I said when I was still at home? That is why I was so quick to flee to, Ta to Tashish. I knew that you are a gracious and a compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. Now, O oh Lord, take away my life, for it is better for me to die than to live. But the Lord replied, have you any right to be angry? Jonah went out and sat down at a place east of the city. There he made himself a shelter, sat in its shade and waited to see what would happen to the city. Then the Lord God provided a vine and made it grow up over Jonah to give him shade for his herd to ease his discomfort. And Jonah was very happy about the vine. But at dawn the next day, God provided a worm which chewed the vine so that it withered. When the sun rose, 
God provided a scorching east wind and the sun blazed on Jonah's head so that he grew faint. He wanted to die and said, it would be better for me to die than to live. But God said to Jonah, do you have a right to be angry about the vine? I do, he said. I'm angry enough to die. But the Lord said, you were concerned about this vine, though you did not tend it and make it grow. It sprang up overnight and died overnight. But Nineveh has more than 120,000 pe 120, people who cannot tell their right hand from their left, and many cattle as well. Should I not be concerned about that great city? This is the word of God, and may God bless to us the reading of his holy word, and to him be glory now and forever. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Zola. Our reading this morning obviously comes from the book of Jonah. Now, how many of you remember the story of Jonah from your Sunday school years? Hands up. Right, Audrey, quickly give us a summary of the book. <laughs> to those of us who can't remember that far back, Jonah was an Old Testament prophet. Now, as we know, the Old Testament prophets usually gave messages from God to God's people. At some point, at some point, these oracles will be filled with judgment and at other times they will be filled with mercy and compassion and often they would be filled with hope now as we page through all the prophets in the old testament we find that all of them spoke to god's people except one jonah jonah is the only prophet in the old testament who's not called to speak to the people of God, but instead to go to the enemy, the Assyrians. Now the Assyrians were the nation that came into Israel and destroyed the 10 Northern tribes, brutally conquering the land and making it part of the Assyrian empire, which we see on the map. That whole darker section was the Assyrian empire and Jerusalem is over here. That was the southern tribes and the northern tribes were over there. They were ransacked, overthrew, and the Israelites were taken into exile, which left the northern tribes devastated and absolutely destroyed. Now the capital of Assyria was Nineveh. How do you say that word? Nineveh. Nineveh. And a fee. That one. Okay. And this is the city that Jonah was called to go to. Now, this was an exceptionally large city. It was so large, in fact, that it took you three days to walk through that city. So we can imagine that when God called Jonah to go to the city in chapter one, Jonah's expression should have been was probably like this. A little bit confused because why would God send him to the Assyrians to the enemy to tell them what well God wanted Jonah to go and tell them that they were going to be punished now surely that would have changed his confused face into a happy one because how many of us would love to go to our enemies and tell them that God is going to punish them. Isn't that the best revenge ever? A righteous revenge. Because if God punishes our enemies, then that meant we were right all along in No Honey Popper Dance. But instead of Jonah being happy about it, he was most upset. <laughs> so upset, in fact, that he tries to run away in the opposite direction, hoping that he could hide away from God. Now, of course, we all know how the story goes. Jonah is on board the ship. God sends a storm. The crew is terrified. They chuck him overboard. Immediately, the crew and the boat is saved. Jonah is swallowed by the fish. Jonah prays to God. 
The whale regurgitates Jonah onto the beach, and there he stands full of fish vomit and seaweed, and now he needs to make a choice. Is he going to go to the city of the enemy or not? And then God calls him again. Now, why would Jonah be upset in the first place? Why didn't he want to go to the Assyrians? Was it because the Assyrians were known for their brutality and their violence, which left Jonah scared? Imagine him going to the mighty army and telling them, my God's going to punish you. They would probably laugh in his face. They would catch him, torture him and kill him. So there's a reason Jonah was terrified. Or was it because Jonah knew that there could be a worse outcome than that? Because he knew the character of God. Jonah was actually quite intelligent. He knew that God was the God of second chances. God was the God of forgiveness. God was the God of mercy, of love, of grace, of faithfulness. And a God who is faithful and always has compassion will always be true to his character. So what if Jonah goes all the way to Assyria, he gives them the message of punishment, they repent and they turn to God. What then? Then all the people living in Israel are going to be most upset with Jonah. Because if he just left it alone, God would have punished the Assyrians. But him going there gives them an opportunity to repent. Which means that the people in Israel would probably catch Jonah and kill him. Leaving Jonah scared. Or perhaps Jonah was upset. Because he felt that the Assyrians didn't deserve a second chance. He didn't want to give them the opportunity to repent. He didn't want them to be included into the kingdom of God. Because he had his own personal beef with them. He didn't want God to spare them. And so actually he just doesn't want to go. And that's why he's upset. But the whole whale stomach experience taught Jonah something. That one needs to be obedient to God. And so off he goes to this gigantic city. With all its many, many, many people. And this is where our reading this morning begins. Because Jonah goes into the city. He walks and gives the wimpiest prophecy ever recorded. And the shortest sermon ever. In Hebrew it's actually just five words. And he says, in 40 days the city will be overthrown. He shouts it once, and then he leaves the city. But this wimpy prophecy changes the people's lives completely. Their response is electric and over the top. Immediately they come to faith in God. The king gives orders that the whole country must go into mourning, that they must wear sackcloths, the people and the animals, and that they must make their confessions before God which they do, and they repent. And in this remarkable way, the enemy of God's people are changed and transformed. Their hearts and their minds are cleansed by God's grace. And God decides not to punish them after all. And what is Jonah's response to God's marvelous act of grace? He's angry. In chapter 1, 4 verse 1, the Hebrew actually says that Jonah felt that when God showed compassion to the Assyrians, God did evil. And now a conversation between God and Jonah takes place. Jonah tells God, I knew it. I knew that you are the God of compassion and grace, that you are slow to anger. So I knew that if these people repented, you won't do anything. In actuality, Jonah is quoting Exodus 34 verse 6 and 7, 
which reads, The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintains love to thousands, forgive wicked, forgives wickedness, rebellion and sin. These attributes and characteristics of God are qualities that we praise God for. They are qualities that we are glad God has. But we also need to remember that those same qualities are there for the enemy. And this leaves Jonah furious. God then asks Jonah a very simple question. Do you have the right to be angry? In a huff and a puff, Jonah goes out, he sits outside the city wall, and he makes himself a shelter because he wants to see what's going to happen to the city. But in Jonah's anger, God still meets him because God makes a little vine grow to give him shade from the hot sun and to ease his discomfort. And Jonah actually seems to enjoy the shade on his head. But the next day, God sends a worm and the worm chews up the vine, and the vine dies. The sun comes up, and there's a horrible hot wind that begins to blow. And the heat from the sun and the wind quickly tires Jonah out so that he's faint. And then Jonah wants to die. He wants to die because he's consumed by his anger and his bitterness. And he cannot think straight. He's one hot, messy ball of infuriating, outraged anger. He even says in verse 9, I'm so angry I want to die. Now what does God say to Jonah? God makes it clear that Jonah had no input in planting or tending to the vine that started to grow and gave him comfort. God also makes it clear that there's 120,000 people in this city. People God created. Cattle. Animals that God created. So why would God not care about them if he created them? And this is where our book just abruptly ends. Now what does the story of Jonah remind us of today? Let's begin with our understanding of God. The story of Jonah is a message meant for those of us who are mature in our faith to understand that God's ways is not always our ways. <coughs> we believe God saves, transforms and changes even the vilest of human beings. Yet, we are often surprised when God does exactly that. When God changes or saves or transforms somebody that we don't like, that we perhaps hate, that we don't think is worthy of being in God's kingdom, then we often act like Jonah did. Instead of being overjoyed or happy or glad that that person came to God, that God has included that person into the kingdom of God, we become upset and irritated and mad. We continue to judge. We try and influence others to also dislike them. We spread stories to show that in fact they hadn't changed at all. But this reading calls us to look in the mirror, to have a look at our innermost being. When it comes to the people we don't like, are we acting like Jonah or do we act like Jesus? Jesus who taught us to love, even to love our enemies, who taught us not to judge, who taught us to care and be kind and be compassionate. But the story also teaches us something else, something that we often forget. God can change his mind. God was going to punish the Assyrians, but he gave them an opportunity to repent. And when they did so with great gusto, God changed his mind and did not punish them. He spares them. And this is one of the most outstanding teachings of the Bible. We can influence God. 
When we make our feelings and our wishes known to God, God responds. Because it wouldn't be a real relationship with God if it were not so. It's because we have a relationship with God that our Lord listens, that he hears our prayers, and that he sometimes changes his mind. God heard the repentance from the Assyrians and he changed his mind. God did the same thing for Jonah. He listened to why Jonah was mad at him. He heard Jonah's feelings and thoughts about this matter. But this time God didn't change his mind. God still didn't punish the Assyrians. And he did try and explain it to Jonah. And it's for this reason that we need to be cautious. If God always seems to agree with our reasoning and our logic, if God only likes and loves the people that we like and love, and if God only hates and dislikes the people we hate and dislike, then we need to double check whether we are in fact worshipping the God of the Bible and not just a version of God that we created because we are comfortable with it. Yes, we are able to make our feelings and wishes known to God. And yes, God does respond to our wishes and our feelings. But sometimes he doesn't. But because God will always stay true to his character, God will always do what is best for everyone involved. We know this because that is what we read in Exodus 34. We know this because that is the reading Jonah quoted. God is always ready to forgive. No matter how often or how big our mess ups are. God is the God of compassion. No matter how wrong our choices may be. God is always the God of grace. No matter whether we deserve it or not. God is always the God who's slow to anger. It takes him quite a long time before he gets fed up and frustrated. God is the God of grace, of hope, and of love. Sometimes God instructs and commands and challenges us with our own big cities that we need to go to. Sometimes God asks us to do things that are very far outside our comfort zones. It goes against everything we think, believe and understand. Sometimes God sends us to our enemies with a message of forgiveness and hope. So what is God calling us to do? Where is our big city that we need to go to? Now, as we think about that this week. We need to remember who our God is, a God of compassion and grace, a God who's slow to anger, who's abounding in love and faithfulness, who forgives wickedness, rebellion and sin. Our God is the same yesterday, today and tomorrow, come what may. This is the God we worship and praise and honour and glorify. He is the God will always be close to us, will always walk with us and will always talk with us. Because if God has compassion for the enemy, imagine how much compassion he has for us. God is the one we can trust now and forevermore. Amen. Let's pray. Lord God, thank you for being the God of second chances. God of compassion, forgiveness, faithfulness, grace and love. Thank you that we are in a relationship with you. Thank you that we can come to you and share with you what's in our inner thoughts and feelings. Thank you that you listen. Thank you for those times you answer our prayers, whether it is with what we want to hear or not. We ask, though, that in those times when your answer is not what we like, help us to know that you know what is best. Help us to remember that you are the God of love and grace and that you ultimately want the best for us, even if we don't always understand it. Help us to remember that you know what awaits us 
as you go through life with us. Help us to always be open to your wisdom, to understand your view before we get caught up in our own thoughts and feelings. Help us this week to hear your voice and know that you are sending us to do, out to do. Help us to identify our big cities that we need to go to and help us to do as you instruct. Give us the insight and wisdom to do what you say we need to do. <coughs> you know what awaits us this week. Journey with us. Enfold us in your arms of love and protection. We pray a special blessing over those on our prayer lists. Be with those who are ill. Help those who are going in for tests this week, going in to see specialists, those going in for operations, and those who are in hospital. Be with them and their families, Lord, as you make your presence known and as you give them enough strength for every single day. Be with those who are home after operations, help them with their physio exercises, and help them to get stronger every single day. We pray for those who are anxious and scared, feeling overwhelmed and burdened with this world's problems. Lord, come and carry those burdens with us. Come and grant us your peace and come and guide us. We pray for the marriages and families in our congregation. Lord, you know every couple, you know every family's issues, problems and fears. We pray that you will be close to every relationship so that healing and forgiveness can occur where it needs to, so that individuals can experience your closeness. Lord, strengthen our families and create places and spaces where we can feel safe and protected. We pray for our country. Lord, you know the lists of problems and dilemmas. They seem to be so many and they leave us hopeless. Going into the shops to buy food is more and more expensive. We are worried, Lord. Worried about our retirement, worried about how we are going to feed our families, worried about how we are going to survive economically. So Lord, please come and help us. Come and be with our country, intervene in the whole ESCOM thing, in the corruption and the sabotage that's happening. Be in our politics, especially as the next election comes closer. You, Lord, know what's going on. And so we pray, God bless Africa, guard her children, guide her leaders, and give us all peace. Amen. We are now going to stand and then we're going to sing When You Walk With The Lord or the other name is also Trust and Obey. Mm -hmm. Then we're going to remain standing for the benediction. Then we're going to remain standing or then we're going to take hands. We're going to move from side to side a little bit mm -hmm. as we sing a benediction over one another. And then we're going to remain standing for the exit of the Bible. I won't forget that one. Okay. So let us stand and then we sing together when we walk with the Lord. When we walk with the Lord in the light of His Word, what a glory He sheds on our way. While we do His good will, He abides with us still. And with all who will trust and obey. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus, but to trust and obey. Not a burden we bear, not a sorrow we share, but our toil he doth richly repay. Not a grief nor a loss, not a frown or a cross, but is blessed if we trust and obey. Trust
trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus, but to trust and obey. What we never can prove, the delights of His love, until all on the altar we sit at his feet, or we'll walk by his side in the way. What he says we will do, where he sends we will go, never fear, only trust and obey. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus, but to trust and obey. Ubabalo lenko si yetu u Yezu Christu, utando luka tiku, ubutelwana lo moyo u yinkwele, malube nani lonke. Enda marika nole van Christus, di lichte van God, en di gemeenska van die heilige gees met elke van jullie wees en blij. En nou may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you and all those whom you love, now and forevermore. Amen. Amen. Let there be love shed among us, let there be love in our eyes. May now your love sweep this nation, cause us a Joy!